Hey, good morning, Bethany Covenant Church. This is Pastor Ryan. Today, we are going to talk about saving faith in God. Exodus is the story of how God liberated the Hebrew people after 430 years of slavery in Egypt. God sent Moses to save the people on his behalf. It was a time when the Pharaoh had forgotten that Joseph saved Egypt and all the world from certain famine. Pharaoh ordered the slaughter of every Hebrew boy that was born. And at that time, there were about 600,000 uh, Hebrew men under the age of 20. Pharaoh always had a hard heart, okay? But God's miracles only made his heart harder. The Passover story is a violent story. It's a painful story but it reflects that there was a greater genocide going on at that time and that there is something actually merciful in God liberating the Hebrews the way he did. So the Lord, he said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But, says the Lord, I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. That's Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. First, the Nile turned from water to blood, and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then the land was covered in frogs, and the Pharaoh hardened his own heart. People were covered by gnats, and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. There was a swarm of flies, and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. The livestock got sick and died, and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. The people were covered in boils, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Egypt was rattled by thunder and hail, and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. The land was covered by locusts, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Darkness fell over the land of Egypt, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And then the final plague, the death of the firstborns, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Ten times we hear in the book of Exodus that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And ten times we hear in the book of Exodus that the Pharaoh hardened his own heart in response to the miracles of God. Ten times God sends these plagues to grab Pharaoh's attention. And ten times Pharaoh refused to listen, believing that he was the only God in Egypt. God can do anything with a soft heart, with a warm heart, with a humble heart, with a tender heart, right? But miracles and signs and wonders, they only make your heart harder without faith in God. We heard earlier Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13, which interrupts the story of the 10 plagues to talk about worship and a meal. And it's very strange to our ears. It sounds very much like an interruption in the story of Exodus. It's about how to gather in family groups. It's about how and when to select the right lamb or goat for sacrifice. It's about how to smear blood on your door frame so you'll be spared the final plague, the death of the firstborn. It's about how to cook the lamb and or goat. It, there, there's a recipe in the middle of today's story. It's what side dishes you should eat with your lamb and goat. You should have some bitter herbs. You should have unleavened bread. Um, it's how to dispose the leftovers, and it's how to eat this meal in a hurry, right? With your cloak tucked into your belt, and with your sandals on your feet, and with your staff in your hand, which made it very difficult to eat food, I'm sure. Now, it's strange because all the firstborn children of Egypt that are not protected by the blood on the door frames are going to die that night. And the book of Exodus is fixated on unleavened bread and bitter herbs. What is this about? Why worry about the menu 
and getting that right when there are people who are going to die that night. But the book of Exodus is not indifferent to the pain and the suffering of the Egyptians that night. The focus is about creating a meal that forever remembers the high price that was paid for salvation. The Passover meal teaches that we eat in haste, we eat in alarm, because something terrible is about to happen, a great tragedy is about to happen, that salvation is going to come, but it's going to come at great cost, right? And anyone who responded by accepting the Lord's shelter that night was going to be saved from certain destruction. God protected all the faithful by passing over them and shielding them. And the lack of blood on the doorframe was a rejection of God's salvation. It was a, the defining symbol that you chose to have a hard heart to the purposes of God rather than a soft heart that melts at the tragedy and responds to what God is asking us to do. Now, I've had three opportunities in my ministry to lead a Passover Seder, um, in this case, a Christian Passover Seder. Um, the meal is full of ritual and mystery that feels foreign to most Christians. And <laughs> I had to keep on looking at the 10 pages of instruction so I didn't mess up the meal. Um, just reading what I had in front of me because it was so foreign to my own experience as a worshiper of God. Um, at one of these Passover seders, I was gently corrected by a Jewish guest who came to this Christian Passover seder, and she corrected my, uh, my poor Hebrew after the evening came to a conclusion. I was kind of embarrassed. One year I worked with um, Jews for Jesus, um, that organization, to see if I could get this quite right. Christians, we have a natural fascination with the Passover meal, and we should. It's a biblical ritual. It's commanded for all eternity in the Bible, and we want to participate in this tradition in some way because we want to celebrate our own salvation, right, that we've been saved from our sins by Jesus Christ. And Exodus chapter 12 explains why the Jewish people continue to celebrate the Passover 3,000 years later. Even Jewish people that aren't particularly observant, they still celebrate the Passover. Why? It's an important part of who they are. Um, it is ingrained into their being. And this story, it should remain an important story for Christians as well. Jesus celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples on the night, or, you know, that night that he went to the cross. And Jesus, he got his heart right with God the Father Almighty by following the old rituals, right? Jesus became our Passover lamb, dying to redeem the sins of the world. And it's only in English that we call Resurrection Sunday, you know, the biggest day in the, the life of the church, Easter, only in English. Swedes call it Pasch, uh, Greeks call it Pascha, uh, Spanish speakers call it Pascua. All of these words mean Passover, okay? That's how most Christians in the world understand Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday, that it is our Passover. Sunday worship, every Sunday that we gather, whether we are in person inside the church building or whether we are at home right now, um, this is always our Passover. Okay, Every Sunday, we participate in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his resurrection that gives us the promise of life and life eternal. And every Sunday, our hearts should soften at the high price of our salvation. Every Sunday, wherever our heart is getting hard, wherever it is getting too firm, it should melt before the truth that Jesus died to save us from our sins. One way that we regularly get our hearts right before God is Holy Communion. And this is the meal that Christians celebrate that is most like the Passover meal commanded in today's scripture from Exodus chapter 12. Um, I gave out at least a hundred of these little communion sets. There's a little there's a little cracker on top and then there's grape juice 
inside here. I gave out about 100 or more of these at our uh, reverse parade a couple weeks ago, right? But the body and the blood of Jesus that we celebrate when we take the grape juice, when we take the unleavened bread right here, it's still unleavened bread. Uh, and that has a lot to do with the commandments from Exodus chapter 12. But the body and the blood of Jesus, they remind us of the high cost of our salvation, right? Um, in, in Mark 14, verses 22 through 25, they tell us what Jesus said at the Last Supper, at the last Passover meal that he participated in with his disciples. Jesus said, he, well, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. The great irony of that Passover meal is that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, but he was not passed over. Jesus willingly laid down his life to save you from your sins and to give you eternal life. The Passover blessing, it's not just for our Jewish friends, it's for all believers. Anyone who avoids Pharaoh's hard heart, right? Anyone who softens their heart to the purposes of God through Jesus Christ becomes a co-heir with Jesus Christ. We are with the firstborn of all creation, Jesus, in our salvation, and that is eternal. Holy Communion celebrates our exodus from sin and death into salvation and eternal life. Now, Jesus' salvation is absolutely free, but it came at an extremely high cost, and it should melt our heart every Sunday, right? God's Son died on the cross so that you might live forever, and that should melt our hearts. You can never earn your salvation by doing all the right things, but there is an expectation that comes with participating at the table. Uh, you don't get to keep your hard heart at the table of the Lord. If you participate in Holy Communion, your heart needs to soften. Anyone who participates in Holy Communion needs to walk away with a changed heart, a transformed heart, a new heart in Jesus Christ. If you want to receive the forgiveness of God, you must forgive others, period. If you want the grace of God, you must offer that grace to others with your own soft heart. If you want salvation, you must soften your heart and help offer salvation to others. If you want freedom in Christ, you must soften your heart and help others discover freedom in Christ. If you want redemption for the mistakes, the failures, the sin in your life, you must soften your heart and help redeem others from the failures in their lives. Like the Passover meal, Communion makes us remember a terrible sacrifice. And this ritual is not about going through the motions, but it's about melting your heart. And we do it month after month in the hope that we pay attention to the huge sacrifice of salvation. That your sins were so great, just your sins alone, that they demanded the loving sacrifice of Jesus. And this truth should shatter all the pride and all the judgment that exists in our heart. Only with a humble heart can we possibly live in Christian community. It's only when we realize that Jesus died for us and paid that terrible price for us that we're able to offer his grace and mercy to the fellow Christians in our lives and those who are outside the warm embrace of the church. As Jesus spoke of the sinful woman who washed his feet with her tears, uh, held her up as a paragon of virtue, this sinful woman, he said, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. That's Luke 7, verse 47. Do you require a little forgiveness or a lot of forgiveness this month. If you come to Jesus with a humble heart, with a tender heart, you will experience God's grace. 
Amen.